I do feel like we have a community of trans women who are empowered today. We don't have to live in the shadows anymore. Trans people definitely need to have their own voice within HIV. You know, we're trans, we're not black gay men. HIV hasn't stopped me from dating. It's not gonna stop me from getting married. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> to step into this life, you have to have tough skin. It's about you standing in your truth. It is okay to live with HIV. It is okay to be accepted. This is who I am. I shouldn't be ashamed of that. I am a transgender woman. I'm so proud to say that. When it comes to really having an impact on HIV as a threat to this community, the only way that we'll, we're gonna move beyond it is really by working together. We're finally on the forefront. You're seeing transgender shows everywhere. Like, we're finally on the forefront and we need to take that platform and really use it. Our stories make an impact, whether we see the results right away or not. They're making an impact and we have to continue to get everyone to understand this community better. Trans people definitely need to have their own voice within HIV. You know, we're trans, we're not black gay men. And we're starting that work here, we're right? Yes. We are. We're we have this opportunity to really speak with each other and get real. We know that HIV impacts so many of our lives, right? Is this something that is well known and understood among trans women in your communities? I definitely think it, it's not. To be honest, in my own community, the conversation isn't happening. To be black uh, and trans, knowing that we're disproportionately affected by HIV, and, and for people to still think that, you, you know, it's not like a necessary conversation, like, it's completely crazy, completely crazy. I think that people have this false sense of security when it comes to, like, HIV. I didn't realize it was an issue for me personally until the first person that I knew living with HIV disclosed to me. And um, it just made it personal. It, made it close. When I decided, well, when I came to the conclusion that HIV was an issue that impacted me, and I realized that so many of my friends were, uh, were positive. Recently, uh, three of my friends have died because of HIV complications. It's, it's dark. It's, it's a really dark area, and I think that, I think that ignorance is most of the time, like the perpetrator. On my teenage years, I was naive, ignorant. I was not educated properly. I was not brought up with making sense of a lot of things. Someone to teach me a couple of things like this is just how to use a condom, how to protect myself with the proper advice, with how to prevent me from getting infected. And why, why aren't trans people having these conversations in communities like yours or communities, you know, where all of us come from? You know, why are these conversations not taking place? I don't think we really feel safe talking about that because we feel like we're adding to the stigma of ourselves when we talk about that with each other. Like in our own community, I don't feel like we had that conversation where we talk with each other, like, this is what HIV is, this is what it can do, this is what you can do to protect yourself against these things. Just the fact that we're trans, and because of how we get criticized on the street, how we get laughed at, how we, they take us like we're a joke, like we're a clown, they don't take us serious. Mm -hmm. So it's fear, it's other people finding out, mm -hmm. it's embarrassment and it's shame. Sometimes we just don't wanna go see doctors, don't wanna get engaged in medical care, don't wanna talk about the HIV itself because it's, it's so fearful. These are real things that we, we just need to talk about. Whether we have fear talking about them or not, it's the importance of talking about it to make it okay. I wanna be able to talk about it. I wanna be able to change the narrative and I wanna be able to have agency to be able to say, these are the things that happened to me and that nobody can be able to like say or speak for me. It's almost coming into 30 that I shouldn't care what people think about me. 
I have been living with this for 12 years. I've been healthy for 12 years. This is a part of who I am. And if I'm gonna stand in my truth, I need to stand in my entire truth. And so I feel very empowered to do that. I myself suffered from my own internalized transphobia of myself. Um, learning to accept the word transgender to me was so hard. Because often in my past, I ran away from it because I saw the stigma and I didn't want to identify that way. And so I, I kept running. Definitely, the self-love is, is probably one of like, the hardest things for me. But like, you know, um, just walking around, you know, I'm, I'm six foot three, and you know, walking around just being happy in my skin is one of the most toughest things to do. Everywhere I go, there's always like, oh, that's a man. Oh, you know, you're too, woman to, you're too tall to be a woman, and you're this and you're that. And you know, it, it, it really bothers me sometimes because I don't care how successful you get or whatever, there's nothing like loving yourself. So, you know, how does all of that play itself out, though? I want to get us back to the risk for HIV. How does it connect back to the risk? A lot of times our self-esteem gets lowered. Mm -hmm. If we're not a part of the cis-heteronormative like, community, we get you know, beat up so much that we don't have much of a spirit to fight or to, to even pay attention to certain things. We're constantly walking around dealing with trauma. How do you expect people to be healthy? How do you expect people to um, advocate for themselves and use a condom? How do you expect people to know the difference between a healthy relationship and an unhealthy relationship when every day that we wake up and we walk out of the house, we're dealing with that trauma or we're being re-traumatized every day? Let's just be real. You know, there's gonna be a lot of places that's gonna automatically discriminate against us. And so you have to understand we have to have something to fall back on. We have to survive. Not everyone has a good job like you and is successful. And so we have to be mindful of that. From the mind of someone who has been a sex worker, um, who, who participated in survival sex to make sure that I was, you know, I had a place to stay and food to eat, I did not want to hear anything about STIs and HIV from someone who I knew thought that they were better than who I was. It saddens me, you know, it makes me, it, it makes me sad that we can't talk about that with each other because we feel like that's gonna be stigmatized against us. I think that people who are stigmatized often, you know, use this notion that like, oh, I'm not as bad as she is, you know, in order to make themselves feel better about who they are, right? So, but do you think that that, you know, goes back to that kind of internalized transphobia? I think when you can say, oh, well, that's not my situation, my situation can't possibly be as bad as that because this, you know, this is who I am, this is what I do. You know, at least I don't snort coke or whatever. If you can find something that you deem lower in another person, it definitely boosts your self-esteem for the next, you know, for the next couple seconds. Well, I'm gonna go back to the if they know my tea part. <laughs> I want to go back there, girl. Because, you know, how do they know your tea? Me being transgender, I'm almost six foot, I think, of broad shoulders. But um, for whatever reason. You're a beautiful woman. Right, that's what, that's what they say. <laughs> but sometimes I don't have to disclose. Other times, I, you know, I have to let them know, you know, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a woman, but I'm a very different kind of woman. I think it, it, it all starts at the beginning, before even starting a serious relationship, being honest with, with the person who I'm going to date. And the hardest part is not so much the gender part, the identity part as transgender is disclosing HIV. Revealing that I'm HIV positive, that will be a harder part for me to do. And the reason is that he's going to ask me questions, how did you get it? How long have you had it? Are you really ill? Are you going to die? Am I, am I at risk? It's, that's the hardest part for me to ex explain to the person, to my partner. He might understand, he might not. That's always going to be like when you meet someone and if you feel that y'all are going to go a long way, you know, that's always the big obstacle that you have to 
get over. Or, you know, some people like to wait till up until the time they are a little more intimate. And it's just like, oh my gosh, are they gonna leave me? What's gonna happen? And sometimes when you really, really like somebody, you don't want them to go. But on the other side of the fence, you have to understand something. If that person does not like that about you, they're not worth keeping to begin with. Being a trans person was more um, of an issue in my dating life than having HIV. I know how it felt for me to like not be aware of someone else's HIV status and having that choice kind of taken from me. Um, and I don't want to put anybody else through that situation. I feel like it depends upon the nature of the situation because I feel like um, responsibility for for your health should be yours and yours alone, just to, to completely honestly. Now, if, if in fact you're in a relationship with someone, that's a, I feel like that's a completely different situation and you will want that person to know where you're at. People have to start taking responsibility for their own health and stop blaming people for you know what I'm saying, their own situation. With all the prevention tools that we have, why might a trans woman with HIV choose to not disclose her status or wait to do so? There are several reasons behind it. My case was, in order for me to speak up or to be comfortable or to be able to even say that I was positive, sometimes it's not that it's approval, but it will start within home. If I'm able to communicate with parents or sister or somebody in my family that will support me and that will say to me, it's okay, I have your back. I support you 100% and I'm gonna walk with you every step of the way. If you get shut down immediately by the family, then right away rejection kicks in. I hid it for so many years. I put myself like in a place where I wanted to hide it as much as I can. I know for me personally, um, my HIV status was something sacred. If we were not intimate, if we were not in a relationship, you know, I felt if you were not like my family or somewhere, somewhere of that nature or whatever, it wasn't your business. I feel like disclosure yeah. of anything about our personal lives is so immensely personal. I think for myself, like the disclosure of being trans, I had to learn how to accept that within myself first. And then from that place, I learned that it's okay to just be and just talk about it because I've accepted in myself. And now I know that nobody can ever bring me down because I know who I am. This is my life. I take charge of it. I write my own destiny. This is my path. This is my book. None of your pages are added. Thank you. Bye. Yes. <laughs> so, Bree and V, you're both in uh, committed relationships, um, and um, <laughs> congratulations, girls. <laughs> so, um, so was HIV something that came up uh, with your partner, and if so, uh, how did you know? What was that conversation like? After we started communicating with each other and before we actually met, we had the discussion because we were aware, and especially with the work I do, and um, that we needed to have this conversation about HIV and getting tested before we did anything sexual at all. Because that was, our health is very important to us and um, we just wanted to know our statuses before we got serious. So social media helped you in being able to kind of have that conversation? Communication, even through email, through text, through FaceTime, mm -hmm. that's what helped us to have this conversation, to make us feel comfortable enough to ask each other these important life questions for each other. I met my partner last summer. Um, we were both um, interning at the same organization and I had spent the whole summer talking about being like a board member of the Positive Women's Network and talking about being a woman living with HIV. So I was under the impression that once we started to develop feelings for each other, that that was something that he knew walking into the relationship. And we were talking on the phone and I was like, yeah, it's a woman living with HIV. And he was like, what? And I freaked out. like. I had never freaked out that much in my life. It was not something that um, I'm, I hide from many of my partners, but it, it's, it's, it's a very sensitive topic. And he was like, 
is that your way of telling me? And I'm like, I thought you knew. And he was like, I mean, I don't really care. Like, it doesn't change the fact that, like, how I feel about you or whatever. And we're just a couple. Like, HIV hasn't stopped me from dating in the past, and um, it's not going to stop me from getting married. <laughs> and I do believe that HIV shouldn't take up as much space as it does in a lot of situations. <laughs> Does PrEP play a role in your interactions with any of your potential partners? Okay, so mm, let me sit up. <laughs> um, PrEP is a pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is basically uh, keeping you from getting HIV, which is, you know, another shield in your arsenal. Um, I think that uh, when I talk to people about PrEP, but like they, especially guys, their first question is like, what the hell is PrEP? What is, I ain't never heard of, you know? And so, you know, having to break that down, it was like, are you serious? They didn't do that already? <laughs> it's like, it's crazy. Cause like, when you like explain to them, like you don't have to catch HIV. HIV. Does PrEP make you feel empowered to make, you know, to, to make decisions around who you're having sex with? I love the, the, this, the option of PrEP because it makes me feel like I'm, I'm protected from something that has stigmatized my community. It, uh, it's, um, it's a big plus for me because to be able to know that I take PrEP and take it faithfully, that I, you know, I don't necessarily have to worry about getting HIV. Mm -hmm. It doesn't protect from other STIs, but HIV is one of the, um, you know what I'm saying, one of the biggest diseases among black trans women. And to know that I am protected how did you hear about PrEP? I was speaking among some friends, and they were telling me about uh, what PrEP is, what PrEP does. And I was like, okay, so break it down. What is, like, what exactly is PrEP? And so they broke it down and told me, like, you know, well, you can take this pill and never get HIV. And I was like, never? Like, what's the, what's the numbers on that? You know what I'm saying? What's the percentage? Um, and it's like 98%, and I was like, that's amazing. So, like, uh, I was pondering it because, you know, I had questions about it and also being on HRT, hormone replacement therapy. Um, and once I, once I found out from my doctor, there are no negative side effects to mixing those two medications. Uh, I was all for it. <laughs> for those of you that are taking antiretroviral therapy, um, you know, do you feel that being on ARVs uh, and reducing your viral load, does that help you in making, you know, decisions about your sexual life? Blossom? If your viral load is undetectable, the chances of you passing HIV is very slim. But some of us tend that some of us tend to get a little excited about that. But I feel like it's important that we still making sure that we're using condoms and, and kind of getting the education and stuff out there. I started taking my antiretroviral medication two weeks before I had my next doctor's appointment. And at that point, I was told I was undetectable. And I was like, two weeks? Like, medication, like, that's supposed to be, like, saving your life can work in, like, two weeks? And I continued to take it, and I saw that my viral level, my viral load was, like, undetectable, and my CD4 count just kept going and going and going to the point to where, like, it was, like, past the thousands. So for me, like, I think that there, were, there are life-saving. I'm HIV positive right now, and I've been positive for so many years. I'm taking care of myself. I'm on medication. I'm healthy. That's the only issue with me right now. You can definitely live a long, healthy life on your HIV meds and transition. It's very possible that you can do that. It starts with you and what you're willing to accept about yourself. I, want, I wanted to live. And so I felt like that was something that I needed to do I felt like that was something that I wanted to do. But what I needed to do is to take care of myself first. As trans women, many of us, uh, not just us, but you know, our community, are also taking hormones. And uh, there can be concerns about anything that might negatively impact uh, you know, the effect of the hormones, including HIV treatment or prevention tools like PrEP. When I decided to get on PrEP, uh, my first question was about, you know, hormone replacement therapy. And 
my doctor, like, you know, because I was nervous because as we all know that hormone replacement therapy has its side effects, you know, emotionally and physically. And I was wondering, you know, are those side effects like deadly to mix with each other? When I found out that it was like, it, it was basically like null and void. Like there's no, like there's no reason why I couldn't transition and be safe, you know? Uh, I was, ha I was hyped. I was happy. That's why it's really important to kind of keep a close relationship with your doctor. When I came into my transition, I didn't know where to go and what resources there were available. So, honey, I got on the internet, Googled, and I start ordering there. And my HIV doctor, when he saw how I was wanting to transition so bad with me, with everything going on with me, that's when he decided to step up and he consulted a colleague about um, hormone replacement therapy and he ended up prescribing it to me. If he hadn't done that, you know, I could have injected something in me that was just dangerous. Silicone or anything could have went to my heart mm -hmm. and I mean, I'd be sitting here. And so I think keeping a relationship with your doctor is super, super critical. important. It's critical. They'll prescribe you exactly what you need and if you're not happy with it, they'll switch them right away. Right now there's so many levels. There's estrogen, there's primer, and you, they'll, they'll give you whatever your body's comfortable with. And if it's not working for you, they'll give you something that will work. And it will work versus taking something really risky. This campaign is about being empowered to take control of your health, our health, and our lives. Where do we go from there? You know. What next? Continue to do what we're doing now and have this conversation, even if it's walking away, each individual one of us, to create that space wherever we go back to. And us being here today, we're speaking for a lot of our people in our community, for a lot of the trans women in our community. And I feel like we are gonna see some results when we come back. We'll be able to say, you know what? I started this, join me and we can all work on it together, you know? What gives you ladies hope for the future? Love. <laughs> I second that. <laughs> what I really hope to see is keeping the hope alive for our trans women, especially those that are living with HIV, who are afraid to come forward and think that they're alone. It is about empowering us to be together and to build together. Well, I just want to thank you all for being so real, so brave so courageous. It's been such an honor to be in the same space with you. Thank you. <laughs>